morning, all. I pray that you are doing well today on today. Uh, we are grateful, as always, uh, for God's grace and allowing us the, uh, the privilege of awakening up to a new day, a new beginning, a fresh start. I always say that today is the day that represents the first day of the rest of our days on planet Earth. And the one thing that we can say resoundingly, without any hesitation, any debate, any um, uh, doubt in our mind, is that God is good, and he is, he's good all the time. And so we are very grateful and just thankful just for the, uh, the privilege uh, that we are allowed to uh, experience in terms of um, being able to gather together in this set setting, in this situation, in this circumstance on today. Uh, we do ask that you will be praying for the Burleson family. Um, the uh, funeral services of Burleson is all going to be on this coming Saturday, uh, viewing from 9 to 11, the funeral is at 11, the Forest Lawn Church and Good Shepherd. I'm going to ask that we would respond accordingly as far as the viewing part is concerned. I'm not sure what time uh, Lois and Mary and them might be there. Uh, I'll try to do my best to find that out, and we'll uh, let you know more in detail about that. Uh, but we're going to go just at least for visitation uh, with them if possible. Uh, but the funeral, we know it's going to be a very private funeral, uh, uh, a funeral for the family. I'm just going to say it that way. Nothing, I think when we say private, sometimes there's a connotation attached to that. Right now, it's not an issue of, of ain't. It's an issue of can't. So um, that's what's going to be happening. The funeral services, again, Willie Wright, who is the brother-in-law of Andrell Stamps and Tyrone, um, his funeral service is going to be at Klein Funeral Home this coming Saturday. The viewing is from 8 to 10. And again, the funeral is at 10 a.m., so uh, let's kind of think through how might might be able to work that out uh, with some of you, just in terms again, just visitation to let the uh, the families know we uh, we do love them and we genuinely are uh, concerned about them. Uh, from my friend, my brother Pat, brother Billy Mason of the uh, uh, Great Oak Grove Church, his service is also going to be Saturday, and that's going to be again from 10 to 11, and the funeral for the family is going to be at the Great Oak Grove Church at 11 a.m. As a matter of fact, it's going to be a double funeral. It's going to be Brother Mason and his daughter are going to both be funeralized at that particular time. So a lot going on in our country, a lot going on in our world, a lot going on in our families. And so we want to, uh, to keep that up almost in our minds. Let's go to God in prayer, and then we're going to look at our study for the word of God today. I pray that some of you already have received the handout by, w by email. Uh, if you haven't, don't get nervous about it. We're going to have some available. Uh, remember, you can always you can always watch the uh, uh, service again uh, that we do at this particular time. You can always watch it again this evening, uh, whether it's Facebook or uh, whether it's by YouTube. It's always on recorded again, so you have an opportunity to uh, to see it. And if you have the handout, you can work through the handout then, also at that particular time. Father, we uh we love you and we thank you again for being God, for being good, for being gracious being merciful and kind and, and generous just beyond our capacity to fully understand. God, we, we know that you're an omniscient God. We know that you're an omnipotent God. We know that you're omnipresent God and that you are everywhere at the same time. Lord, we know that everything that you do is always well done. Uh, you never make a mistake. You have never made an error. And so we're convinced all that's taking place in our world now, it's not out of your control. You are aware of everything. You are in control of everything. You can stop it when you want. You can keep it going if you choose. You could cause it uh, to disappear if you, if you chose. So, Lord, we know that's the kind of power you have. And so we submit ourselves to you on this day, again, recognizing that you are God, knowing that you got all power and knowing that you can do all things and that whatever you do, anytime you do it, it's always the best thing that could ever be done. And so this morning, Lord, I want to lift before you Artis Turner. You know his situation and his circumstance. I want to lift before you our own friend, uh, Ray Olivier, uh, who is a, a partner of this church. We pray for the Spring Branch Transitional Health Care Center where uh, Cortesia uh, works, and we just pray again your protection upon those people that are there and the issues that their families are dealing with. Father, I pray for parents and children who are 
going through the process now of getting ready for school and trying to understand what to do, Lord, trying to get a, a, a handle on how you would lead, how you would guide, how you would direct, what you would say for, for them to do, what you would say should happen. I pray, God, for our governor. I pray again for our uh, state attorney. I pray, God, that the decisions that they're making uh, as it relates to our schools, as it relates to our teachers, as it relates to our children, has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with money. But it has everything to do with just concern for people, for the safety of people, Father. So I pray that you would move in their hearts, uh, move in their minds, God. If that's what you choose, well, your will be done because we know you got it covered. But, Lord, if it's for any reason other than that, I pray that you would intervene as you always do. Uh, that you would just have your way in it. God, we know we know that even when people choose to be stubborn, we know the kind of power you got. You did it with Pharaoh. You did it with Nebuchadnezzar. You did it with the kings of Israel. You did it with the kings of Judah. God, we know the kind of power you have. And so we ask in Jesus' name that you would just have your way in the midst of all these situations, in the midst of every circumstance. God, there are a lot of people that are unemployed. There are a lot of people don't have jobs. There are a lot of people, God, who are struggling today that have lost their jobs since early March. Uh, some of them still can't recover. There are some people who have gone back to work, but the money that they lost still doesn't make up for the losses that they've experienced. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just intervene as only you see fit. Help us as the Church of Jesus Christ universally locally, statewide, Harris County, Houston, Texas, Sedegas, wherever we may be, God, help us to come alongside uh, our community, those in society, and help us to do our part. If it's something, if it's, a, if it's a piece of bread, God, help us to supply that piece of bread. If it's school supplies that we can supply, help us to do whatever we can do to help those persons who are struggling who don't have jobs, who are not making money as they used to make it. And God, that you would again just meet those needs as only you can do. And then I pray, God, again for um, those who are dealing with COVID-19, all kinds of different ways, whether it's hospitalization. Uh, we know what's going on, even with our own family members right now, God. And we lift Renee before you and ask again your grace and your mercy continue to be upon her. We pray again for all of our, our relatives, some in Ville Platte, some in Lake Charles, uh, some in South Carolina, some in other places, God, that we know about. And we just ask in your grace and your mercy continue to be on each and every one of them. God, we know that you are the healer. We know that you are the great physician. We know that all power is in your hands. And so we, we submit them to you. We know you've already brought some folk a mighty long way already. And so we know you're not about to leave them now, God. So we thank you for everything that you're doing. And then, Lord, for persons who have been experiencing death, I just pray again for those families, Lord, that you would just give peace and comfort and solace and Lord and just help those families to know again that you are God and beside you there is no others. I pray for those families who don't know Jesus still in the guilt of their sin having to go through this kind of troubling time Father. I pray that in some way somehow that your gospel will reach them and that they will come to the saving knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and they too will be able to know you like we know you and even beyond that they would again serve you and worship you and, and honor you and glorify you in every way uh, they possibly can. And so Father I just thank you uh, for allowing us this privilege one more time. It's a good day. And we thank you for it. So we do pray again for the Mason family. We pray for the Burleson family. We pray for the Wright family. And we pray again for those extended members of our church and even uh, those friends and relatives that have that we don't know anything about. God, that you would give peace to those families that are looking, for, looking toward this weekend to bury loved ones, the pain, the sorrow, the difficulty that comes with it. But God, help them to know you will never leave them nor will you ever forsake them. So we thank you again just for the privilege of prayer. Thank you again for the responsibility of prayer. And God, we submit all of these prayers to you, knowing that you will answer as you see fit. And we're going to be satisfied however you do it. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Listen, I want to well, well, again uh, encourage you all to turn in the book of Romans. What we're going to be doing today is just kind of doing a, a, uh, a quick flyover, and really this is it. Um, I'm saying it to my brothers who may be listening today that this is in no way uh, a complete study uh, at all, no even an attempt to say it's a complete study on the, uh, the book of Romans, but what we're doing in our reading for um, we've gone, we're reading through the book of Romans, and today we would actually be in uh, chapter 13, uh, chapter 12, actually, of the, uh, of the book of Romans. But so what we're going to do is just look at an overview of what we've already looked at, and just look at some practical insights, some things, some principles uh, that the Word of God will give us as it relates to the doctrine that was taught by the Apostle Paul as it relates to the book of Romans, and so it gives us uh, some ways to how to manage that. There's a, there's a book that has been written, The Doctrine uh, that, uh, the, that Dances, if you will. And what we always want to look at is though we look at doctrine, which again is instruction in the Word of God, it's a way of understanding the things of God. But it's important to not look at doctrine just from a standpoint of information. It's important to look at doctrine from a standpoint of transformation and to see now how doctrine applied properly or understood properly uh, in our lives actually has the capacity and the ability, if you will, to help us to understand the word of God a little bit more succinctly and, watch, and to live that word of God daily. You know, that's the one thing I love about the Word of God. It doesn't matter where we go, uh, we, we recognize it as timeless truth, and it doesn't matter where you go in the Bible, there's something you can learn about God, and keep that in mind. Anytime you go to the Word of God, that it is about God. The Bible is not necessarily primarily about you and me. It is, it does entail what God is revealing to us but it's really about him and how we are to approach him, how we are to know him. And then as a result of approaching him properly, knowing him through the study of the word of God, praying to him as a means of communicating with him, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that remind us of his greatness and his goodness, then what can happen is, it gives us an appreciation of who God is, and no matter what comes up in life, we trust him, we rely on him, we depend on him, and the greater evidence of that is how we what? Obey him. So the book of Romans, though it has a lot of doctrinal issues, it is helping us to understand that these doctrinal issues are designed to help us to appreciate, acknowledge, and watch this, ultimately, obey God. So we did say Paul, Paul didn't start the church at Rome. You know, we talked about that uh, a couple of Sundays ago. He wasn't the one who started the church at Rome. Some believe that it could have been some people from Acts chapter 2 uh, when the Jews were there, when, uh, when they had come uh, for the, uh, the feast of the Passover. Now they're into what was called the day of Pentecost. Um, uh, they, they, they went back to their various homes, Jews, and they started churches in those areas. They started to share the gospel, and they became what church, if you will, the ecclesia, the assembly of, uh, of believers. So uh, others believe that is at a time when Paul was on his missionary journey that some people heard him share the gospel, and they went back to Rome again there and started community, started having, we would say, Bible study from the standpoint of the Old Testament, understanding again the things that had been understood based upon what Paul had taught, connecting the Old Testament with that pointed up to Jesus and teaching these things from the standpoint of what was going on in his culture, what was happening in his time, and it connecting it back to the, to the Messiah of the, Old, of the Old Testament and to see how it could productively work, if you will, in the life of the people. So therefore, when we look at that study of the book of Romans, the one thing that, that, uh, that stands out is that it's very, very doctrinal. You know, some people will say that the uh, four Gospels help us to do what? Help us to understand Christ. It explains Christ. It's, it explains the life of Christ. But Romans answers the so what question. So what? That he lived. So what? 
that he died. So what that he was buried? So what that he rose from the dead? So what that he ascended back to the Father? So what he made the promise that he would return? That's the gospel in a nutshell. And remember, Paul reminds us that it was it is what the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So, but it answers the question of so what? How do we how do we get to the point that we make the word we use that that language that the word becomes al alive in us that it's not just information it's not just words on in a in a book uh it's not just names that we hear about of people uh, you know many years ago no how does it work in my life today how does it work in your life today how does it apply to us uh today so the book of romans is designed to uh, uh just give us some doctrinal insight but to help us again to apply it in a practical manner uh, in terms of uh, the life that God has given us. So uh, if you're looking at the handout, basically I'm just kind of clumping, and this is what this is called. So I'm already saying again to, uh, to pastors, to students of the Word of God, uh, those of you who do in-depth study, uh, it's clear, you, you, you know, just with the things that I'm going to be sharing, it's clear that we're not, we're not doing a real deep dive, if you would, in terms of doing an exegesis or commentary uh, on, the, uh, on the book of Romans. It's just, again, to give us some practical things that we can make transportable, if you would, as a way of looking at the book in its entirety. So when we look at chapters one, uh, basically, the, again, the, uh, the, the uh, title today is or the overview of the book of Romans, the righteous of God lived, the righteousness of God lived by faith, or God's righteousness lived by faith. God's righteousness, what he's given to us, how do we live that by, we understand, by faith. Number one, if you look at that, when we look at chapter one to, through chapter three, verse 20, uh, we're filling in some blanks there, so I'm going to ask that you would get ready for that. The gospel is God's power and righteousness lived by faith while the rebellion of both Jews and Gentiles, filling in the blanks, absolutely fails. The gospel is God's power and righteousness, filling in the blank, if you will, lived by faith while at the same time, simultaneously, the rebellion of both Jews and Gentiles absolutely fails. Fails. So what we learn in the word of God is an is amazing thing about uh, God's word is that, you know, as Paul is, is teaching that, one of the things that he reminds us in verse 16 uh, and 17, and we preached that a couple of uh, Sundays ago, so some of you can remember, is that he reminded us as it relates to the word of God, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, why? For it is the power of God. And we're talking about the gospel because that's how, that's what makes the book of Romans important that it extends, if you would, the gospel, the good news. It explains the good news concerning Jesus Christ. So what that says to you and I as we, again, how do we, in, in terms of us working that out from a practical standpoint, what it says to you and I, uh, the gospel is God's power. And again, we know that, that it has the power what, to draw us, and that's what the, the gospel has done. It, he, he, God has used the gospel to draw us to himself. We have seen the fullness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And not only that, God has now declared us righteous. And so now, what do we do? We can live by faith the declared righteousness that God has given us. That is, that is a wonderful thing to think about it, that I have the ability he would, he would talk about that in Romans, in Romans uh, chapter 12. I actually, we have actually been given the ability, folk, to please God. <laughs> we, we have been, we've been given the ability to do the right thing, to make the right choices in life on the basis of what? What we believe concerning Jesus Christ. And now, how do we do that? We live that out, what? Depending on God. We live that out trusting in God. Now watch this. Just as well as we see the righteousness of God in terms of how it helps us to live to please God, that same righteousness actually identifies people who are in rebellion against God. 
when you look at when you look at a chapter, you know, further down in a uh, in chapter in chapter one of uh, of the uh, of the book of Romans. Let me just just do it this way. If you if you're looking at chapter chapter one, one of the things that he points out, which is quite awesome, is that rebellion is going to be dealt with. Rebe- rebellion is against God is going to be dealt with. Look at again, even look at verse uh, 28. I just want to go there. Uh, let me start at verse 24, if you would, chapter 1. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Go to verse 28. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debased mind to do things which are not fitting. That's an important thing uh, in, one, in chapter 1, verse 28. And the reason that that's important is because remember what we said, that the righteousness, that, that the declared righteousness that we have attained, that we have from God, which again is demonstrated through what the power of the gospel that is also revealed the righteousness of God, which, watch this, we live by faith also, wow, demonstrates or gives an indication of people who choose not to believe God. Because remember, when, we, when you read around verse 18 to verse 23, it says that God has put, he's put the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, he's pressed creation before us, to give evidence that he does exist, correct? But he would say, what would people would do? People would rather than look at the sun and, and think about the God who created it, they would actually try to make a picture of the sun and worship that. They would look at a cow, and rather than looking at the one, the creator that made the cow, they would actually form a cow in, 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 in some image of their own, And worship that cow. Same righteousness of God, because what are we talking about? A standard that God has determined uh, how we to approach him, what we to do toward him. So when people reject that standard, in other words, God, in in, in other words, God God puts himself in a position to say, okay, let me prove to you who I am. I'm going to give you every absolute uh, uh, proof that I am who I am. But then the word would say that he does it in a way that to show them that they were what? They were without excuse. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Watch this. So that they are without excuse. So God has done all that he has done. Creation, everything that he's done to say, I exist. So I want, I want to prove to you, I want you to test me, if you will, that's what God is saying, to see if I meet your standard. Well, folk don't, folk reject that standard. Make idols, worship idols. So now God says, okay, so now you have determined I'm not good enough for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn you over into what you believe to be what it is, but to understand this. That whatever human beings believe, he would remind us in Genesis chapter 6, every intent of man is evil continually. Every, the heart of man is dark. The heart of man does not want God. The heart of man rejects God. As a matter of fact, he would, you know, he would, he would lead us to see that uh, through chapter 2. And then, of course, when you get to chapter 3, again, of the book of Romans, he deals with that exclusively. He, and he makes this conclusion in verse number 9 of chapter 3. He says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged, watch this, both Jews and Greeks are Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Every human being born since Adam comes into the world in sin. David would say it in Psalm 51. uh, I was shapen in what? Iniquity. So we are born with the death sentence of sin already on us. And notice how the word of God describes the human human depravity. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good, no, not one. I'll just stop there. So when you think about 
those of us who are believers, what God has delivered us from. When we think about who we were, we would think about what we were. When we think about the things that we have done, and God chose to save us through the gospel, the power of God, which is the gospel, uh, the message concerning Jesus Christ, and then in turn declares us righteous folk, folk, think about it. Uh, to reject that, to reject the possibility of living a life to please God, ultimately will end in failure. And that's the point that he's pointing out when we look at chapter 1 to chapter 3, verse 20 of the book of Romans. He is saying that to reject God puts me or puts humanity in a position whereby they can never come to a sense. Those who reject him, those who say, I don't want you, those who choose to live life on their own. And so what that says to us, we ought to thank God for what he has delivered us from. And because of what he's delivered us from, it ought to be a motivation. It ought to be the thing that get us up in the morning ready to worship him, ready to serve him, ready to do what's right by him, ready to go on my job and give it the best that I can, ready to do what I can for my family, even in the pandemic, the roughness that's going on with children at home. But I wake up every day with the intent that I want to please God. Now, sometimes I got to go in my room. I got to cry out to God who I know can help me. But in the midst of it all, because of the fact that God has allowed me to see him for who he is, he has now given me, I have the ability, I've been declared righteous before him, it ought to motivate me to want to please him with everything that is in me. Look at chapter, chapter 33, uh, starting at verse 21 to chapter 4, verse 25. We're filling in the blanks now. The righteousness of God or God's righteousness lived in the sphere of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. It's attained. That's the word. Fill in the blank. That The word attained, A-T-T-A-I-N-E-D. It is attained and applied by faith alone. Yeah, yes. <laughs> this righteousness that we have attained, it is applied by faith alone. First of all, what we read in the Old Testament, we read the scriptures, he says in verse 21 of chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. He brings into uh, the fact that he has a mixed audience for the Jew, the believing Jews, uh, uh, the believing Christians in Rome are concerned. Some of them are Jews and some of them are Gentiles. So he points out to those Jews who would have a background of studying the old scripture, he would help them to understand that the law that God gave was a law that also had to be applied by faith. It, it was by faith because remember, he said it in the back of chapter 2, the just got to do what? Live by, yeah, faith. And so even though God gave the, the law to Moses, Ten Commandments, 613 ways to live out those Ten Commandments. But the reality was that God was saying it had to be done by faith. And so he would even work it through to say, watch this, what, but, but then Lord, what, what about the folk who came before the law? We know that the law came like some 1,446 years before uh, uh, Jesus Christ came. But what about before that law? What about folk like, like Adam and Noah and, and Enoch and, and, and Abraham? What, what about them? Well, guess what? They had to do the same thing. They had to apply what faith in God. And what are we talking about there? We're talking about trust. We're talking about reliance. We're talking about dependence. You know, one of the things you got to remember when we look at uh, Genesis chapter 6, I mean, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 11. You don't have to turn there. Genesis chapter 12. Well, we have the introduction of uh, Abraham. One of the things that sometimes we miss, I, you know, I, I hear people talk about the blessing of Abraham. And many times they talk about the blessing of Abraham. It's attached to money, and it's attached to wealth, and it's attached to power, and it's attached to prestige. Here's one of the things you got to understand. When Abram and his family left Ur of the Chaldeans, they were already rich. They already had a lot of stuff. So stuff wasn't really the issue. God, did God bless him with more stuff? He absolutely did. But that was, he was already blessed with stuff even before he left. Because when you read in chapter 12, it talks about he left with his possessions. He left with some servants. Um, he left with some people. So he was already a man who was well to do even before 
he, he was told by God to leave his family and go to a country where he would show him. Now, while he is there, God does say to him, I'm, I'm going to bless you. And in you, every family of the earth is going to be blessed. Get to chapter 15. Uh, because remember, he's at, he's at 75 years old, don't have no children. Wife is 65, don't have no children. And God is making the promise, hey man, y'all gonna, you're going to be the father of many nations. Now, how am I going to be the father of many nations when I'm even, not even the father of one person? He has that discussion with God in Genesis chapter 15. He says, I got one heir, his name is Eliezer, and he's an heir of my home. And so I'm figuring, God, uh, maybe you're going to use Eliezer to be the one. God said, no, 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 he's going to come from your own body. Now, here at this point, 99 years old. He's 99 years old, man. And so God is now reiterating the promise that he made 24 years earlier. He's reiterating the promise that he told him when he was 75, couldn't have no children. Now he's 99, still saying to him, you are going to have children. And the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 15. He told him, he said, man, I want you to go out and look. I want you to, first of all, I'm going I'm to bless you that if you could count the number of the dust on the ground, that's how many descendants I'm going to bless you with. He said, then I want you to go out and I want you to look at the stars. And um, I want you to see all the stars that are there. If you can count them, that's how many descendants I'm going to bless you innumerable, with innumerable descendants. And the Bible says this in verse, cha- I think in verse, six of G- yeah, verse 6 of Genesis chapter 15. And Abram believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. I love that, y'all. <laughs> he, he, he just believed what God said. And watch this. And here's what the Bible says. God credited his faith as righteousness. God credited his faith at right, as righteousness. Because I would, Now watch this. Watch this. Abram already rich. The Bible would say he had gold. He had silver. He had he had people he had servants he had all of that going on but the one thing he desired most was to have a child he didn't have a child so he had a lot he had a lot going on but that one thing that elusive thing and what he recognized at that point the only way he could have that would have to be God would have to give it but what did he do he trusted God he relied on God and as a result of that God credited to him to say now that's righteous Mm, mm, mm. (laughs) the fact you believe me that's righteous you know it's it's, it it it, it would be akin to you know um, you being in a position saying you know uh, in terms of you know you, you you come to a point in life that you 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 pretty much got every, everything in terms of, you know, you've attained so much, but then uh, that's one thing that you don't have. And somebody would have said to you, look, um, uh, you know, just give me, I'm just, I'm, I'm just using it as an analogy. So here's a young person who, who, who is trying to attain something, hit, kind of hit a hard, a, hard, a hard spot in life. And the only thing your parents say to you, look, I need you, I need you, uh, young person, I need you to just put $1,000 in the bank. But daddy, mama, I need that money. I'm trying to get somewhere. I'm trying to do something. Just put the $1,000 in the bank. Don't just do what I'm saying. Just put it in the bank, all right? The fact that you would obey your parents, you put that $1,000 in the bank, and, and, and as you say, you've been struggling, man. It's, it, it's like, you know, you don't know how you're going to make it. But the fact you listen to them, the fact you took their advice, what would happen now is that at some point when you start to need that money, Every time you went to the bank with that thousand dollars you put in, every time you went to the bank, you found what you need. And and there was even more. It was but it started with trusting to at least put down that a thousand dollars. And now every time you go in, because what's happening, somebody else is making sure that that what you need is always supplied. So here's what God did for us through Abraham. God is uh, 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 in the style of Abraham because Abraham becomes, and you fill filling in the blank, he's the primary example. He's our primary example in terms of faith. So here's what it means is that Abraham believed God and God accounted it. He credited it to him as righteousness. So now that's why Abraham Abram was able to live the life that he lived because now he has been declared righteous by God. 
So, so even when he makes those mistakes that he made, when he lied, when he said that Sarai is my sister and he knew she was his wife, God protected both them. And when they left Pharaoh, uh, when you read it up further in uh, Genesis 15, when they leave Pharaoh, he leaves them, he gives them stuff, he gives them uh, 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 possessions to leave with. Why? Because he had already been credited with being declared righteous by God. And all I'm saying is that when... When we trust God by faith, we have the righteousness of God. When we attain the righteousness of God, we now live out our lives in such a way that it pleases God. Now, understand this. It doesn't mean that you're going to be rich like Abraham, the physical. It doesn't mean that. That's not what it's talking about. But it is saying that when it comes to make decisions in life, you have wisdom, you have understanding, you have knowledge, you have the ability to make ends meet. It may not be overflowing. It may not be a whole lot of extra but you have the understanding that God knows how to supply why because you have trusted in him by faith and watch this ultimately that faith is in the person of Jesus Christ because when it says that Abraham uh, uh, was was accounted as righteous God credited him with righteousness guess what Jesus had to pay the price mm -hmm. Jesus is the one that had to to give up his life to sacrifice himself and to place what, what Abram believed in is that Jesus became the practical uh, 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 means whereby God would say, put your faith, your trust, your confidence in him and you will be declared righteous. So today what we were looking at, Abraham, the things that he believed, uh, it, was, it was given to him uh, in, in a very real sense, but it was given to him in the person of Jesus Christ. And here's what's amazing about that. When you think about it, the Bible would say in Revelation 13 that he was the lamb that was what, slain before the foundation of the world. Now, that's just, that just blows my mind that even though physically Jesus had not yet come, even though physically Jesus was not on the planet, in God's mind, it was a done deal. And so those who put their faith in God, in the word of God, as Abram did, are the ones who actually experience that in its totality on the basis of the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to clap their head, you ought to shout for joy, that even though he wasn't physically born, it still was applied to them. Why? Because God had put it all in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Wow. Chapters 5 through 7, let me fill in some blanks, and I, got, I, can't, I can't stay that as long as I have. Wow. I declared righteousness, or the righteousness of God, or God's righteousness through Jesus Christ provides peace with him. That's filling in the blanks there. It provides peace with him and subsequently dominion over sin. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, you, you, most of us, again, familiar passage. There, there, therefore, have it. Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Therefore, having been justified, therefore, having been declared righteous, we have peace with God. Is there anybody here today would say that in the midst of everything that's going on, I still got peace? <laughs> and watch this. Peace, peace is not the absence of confusion. No. Peace is that internal, that internal sense, that internal knowledge, that internal security, that internal understanding that no matter what's going on on the outside, it is well with my soul on the inside. Somebody ought to hear what I'm saying. There are people that are going through COVID-19 on ventilators and all of that, but guess what? They can ex still experience the peace of God. That's the folks saying, man, ever since this thing has been going on, my husband and both, my, my husband has got on my nerves. My wife has got on my nerves. These children have got on my nerves. But guess what? At some point, you arrive at what? Peace 
with God because that's what being declared right with God gives you. So think about this. Think about this. Remember we talked about in chapter 1, those persons who reject God and how they live in darkness. But those of us who have been declared right by God, we now have peace with God, which means we are no longer enemies of God. It, does, it, does, it, it, doesn't mean, it, it means that there's no longer division between us and God. We are in a right relationship with him. And I want you to think about that the fact that you are in a right relationship with God says that God will take care. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what somebody's saying. Well, I mean, how, did, how is God taking care of us now when we're in COVID-19? How is God taking care of us now when we are, when we are afraid, some of us are afraid to come out of our house? How is God taking care of us now when we don't even know what to do with our children going back to school? Well, we got proof that God has been taking care of us. And what we've got to do, watch this, live by faith. Still making those decisions that please God, even in spite of what's going on. And God is saying to us that it's only through that that we can experience that peace. Be anxious for nothing, he says. But in prayer, supplication, what? Let your request be made known to God. And what? He promised that the peace of God, uh, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I don't know how you arrive at that peace, but all you got to do is think about God. You know, sing a song that reminds you of his greatness. Pray a prayer. Read, a, read the scripture, something that will remind you. Some of you got a favorite movie that reminds you about something about God. Look at that movie. Whatever it takes for you to arrive at that peace, because that's where he wants us to be. He wants us to know that even when the disciples, you remember, they were on the water, man, and God allowed the storm to come, and man, they were, the Bible says they were in the, they were in the boat, and now water was getting in the boat, and they were troubled. But Jesus said, what, peace? Be still. Somebody today needs to know that you have been declared righteous, and as a result of your faith in God and the righteousness that God has given you as a result of your faith in him, that you put your faith, your confidence, your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, everything that comes with Jesus, you have it. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. And we're getting ready to talk about that. The Holy Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, what is love, joy, peace. Y'all know we got that in our building. It's all around us. We get a reminder of it. Every, every Sunday, every Wednesday, we used to walk. And every time we walked in this building, we were reminded of the fruit of the Spirit that we, are, we experience on a daily basis. And one of those things is just to have the peace with God. Not the absence of confusion on the outside, but the sense of an, a knowledge and an understanding that all is well within. All is well within. So he says, and then again, he says, subsequently, we also have what dominion over sin. You look at a chapter in chapter 6. Uh, Paul talked about the whole thing as far as, uh, as far as believers are concerned. And we need to know that. We dead to sin. Sin is dead to us, folk. Sin shall not have, look at verse 14 of chapter 6. For sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law, but under grace. Uh, for y'all, for the millennials that are out there, some younger than y'all, I have no idea what I'm talking about. There used to be a fella, uh, as a comedian, his name was Flip Wilson. And boy, he used to wear, he'd do this thing, a woman named Geraldine. And he put on this, this wig and this dress and all that kind of stuff. And any time he would do something wrong, he said, the devil made me do it. Well, guess what? We can't ever say the devil made us do anything. Why? Because sin no longer, oh, praise the Lord, sin no longer has dominion. I've been declared righteous by God. You've been declared righteous by God. Sin no longer has dominion over us. You know, you know uh, I, I hear people talk about it in the therapeutic community. You know, when people are addicted to whether it's alcohol, drugs, whatever their addictions may be, one of the things they say, they ask, they ask, what is your drug of choice? And they will declare. It's, you know, whatever, whatever that drug may be or whatever that uh, alcoholism may be, whatever it is, they, they declare that that's what it is because that helps them. Well, you know, what I've learned with us as believers, we have sins of choice. Whatever it is that we do, it's not because we have to do it, is because we simply choose to do it. We have been declared right by God and sin no longer has 
dominion over us. We, we, don't, we don't, because of this righteousness, we don't have to say, yeah, you're going to make me cuss you out. No, that's something we want to do. You're going to make me hurt you. That's something we want to do. You're going to make me slap you. Yeah, that's something we want to do. You're going to make, uh, nobody can make us do anything. Why? Because we have been declared righteous by God, and that says now that sin no longer has dominion over us. Woo. Woo. My family knows that I'm being transparent now. I, I, I used to, um, I used to drive real fast when I was a youngster. Real fast. And uh, I don't take any pleasure in that now. I used to laugh at it, but, uh, but it's pretty disgusting to me now because I, I think about it. I could have I killed some people. I could have I could have killed I could have hurt somebody real badly by now, but it's all about the grace of God that I didn't do it. And and still to this day, I still have the need for speed. I do. I admit it. And sometimes I catch myself and and watch this. If I'm not careful, I want to kind of give myself some grace about speeding. You know, hey, it ain't no big deal. Everybody doing it. But if 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 there is a sign that's a speed limit that say I have to admit, I'm breaking the law. And then watch this. God is saying to obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So I don't have to do what I'm doing. Whatever it is that I'm doing, it is a choice. Boy, I tell you, since this pandemic, I don't put on some pounds. Ooh, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. And, and I tell you, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a struggle. I'm talking about just personally for me. But what I recognize, I can make better choices. I could do some things that are different. I find myself doing it for a moment. Then the next moment, I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. So, so sin no longer has dominion over us. God is saying to us, it's a choice that you and I make. But understand, the fact that you have the righteousness of God, uh, sin no longer has dominion over you. Chapter, chapter 8 would say, uh, the righteousness or God's righteousness frees us from, here's that word, condemnation. There is therefore what? No condemnation. He says it in, in chapter 8, verse 1. It says, while the Holy Spirit empowers us to live victoriously, again, if you fill in in the blank, victoriously in the present and the future. Uh, the righteousness of God frees us from condemnation. Uh, devil can't say, we going to hell and we bad and all. No, no, no. There is therefore now no condemnation. We are no longer under the wrath of God for the, like those who choose to reject God in Romans chapter 11. There, uh, Romans chapter 1, I'm sorry. There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in the sphere of Christ Jesus. And then on top of that, God gives us his Holy Spirit who lives in us who abides in us, who resides in us. Isn't that amazing to think about that? Uh, 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 y'all remember, some of y'all remember, and, and sis who owned the line, it's others, uh, Rodney Freeman who owned the line, some others that I know are listening. We used to sing a song years ago. They say, come on, Holy Spirit, come on, Holy Spirit, come on, Holy Spirit, if you don't stay long, if you don't stay long. And we would sing that with gusto, man. we sing that with everything that was in us. But we come to recognize the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. God has given us the Holy Spirit who abides in us. And that is, that is just an amazing thing to think about the fact. We're no longer under condemnation, and we have the guarantee from God that we're no longer under condemnation. Why? Because the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Yes. Listen, listen. Let's, let's face it, folks. Let's face it, folks. Right now with this COVID-19, there's a sense of there's a sense of, of of weariness and weariness and concern that many people have, but you know it's a whole lot of folk who are a little bit concerned right now. Once God allows a vaccine to be to be uh, discovered, and we get vaccinated with that COVID, you know we're gonna get, some of us gonna get a little more bold. Oh yeah, we're gonna be oh oh why? Because we're no longer going to be in this state of condemnation where we could die, we could get hurt. Why? Because the vaccine is going gonna, is gonna to be, we're going to be convinced in our mind that that vaccine is going to be the thing that I'm needed no matter what. And here's what God is saying, that you can live, the, you're no longer living under the condemnation, under the wrath of God. Why? Because God has declared you righteous. You ought to praise the Lord for that. And then on top of that, he's given you his Holy Spirit 
to help you live out a righteous life, to help you make decisions that are pleasing to him, to help you to know how to live on a daily basis, whether it's in your home, whether you're driving in the in the uh, 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 in, in society, whether you're on your job, whether no matter where you are, he's given you that ability to make those proper decisions. I'm rushing. I'm rushing. I'm going to chapters nine uh, through eleven, and let me fill in the blanks there, and uh, I'm gonna have to let you guys go. Look what he says: the righteousness of God prevails. Watch this in His choice. Filling in the blanks. In his choice, in his choice to provide salvation through Jesus Christ as he wills, filling in the blanks again, based on, based only, I'm sorry, based only on his wisdom and knowledge. Wow. This is, this is something you ought to think about this. That God chooses you not on the basis of you or me, but he chooses us on the basis of himself. There's nothing special about me that would cause God to choose me other than the fact he just chose me. That's all. Nothing would cause God to choose you other than the fact he simply chose to choose you. So when we look at chapters 9 through 11, he's dealing with it from a standpoint. He talks to the Gentiles, but he's also now dealing with the Jews. Um, his heart's desire, he would say, um, in verse in verse. Uh, uh, in verse 3 of chapter 9, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, of whom are all the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all and eternity blessed God. Amen. He had a desire for the Israelites to be saved, those even who had rejected them. He wanted them to be saved, to come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But what he recognized that, that what made somebody a Jew was not just the fact that they were circumcised. Because when he talked about the whole thing with circumcision, he actually took it back to Abraham. He said Abraham was actually declared righteous before he was even circumcised. He talks about the law. He said that the law was righteous. Why? Because the law came from God. And so whether we were Jew or whether we were Gentile, it was important to understand that God chose whom he was going to save just totally on the basis of his own will, on his own desires. He laid it out in uh, chapter, chapter 9 when you pick up at verse 6. He talked about all of those, those different examples that he gave, um, you know, Abraham, uh, and it wasn't Eliezer. It was Isaac who was the chosen child. Uh, when he got to Esau and Jacob, who were the children of Isaac, uh, even though Esau was the oldest, and by birthright, he was the one that was to receive the blessing. God, rather, chose Jacob. So what it says is that God can choose whomever he chooses. He got to the issue with uh, Moses and, and, and Pharaoh, and God said if he chose to harden Pharaoh's heart, there was nothing Pharaoh could do about that. And even in him hardening Pharaoh's heart, God ultimately allowed the children of Israel to be delivered from bondage. Why? Because he would declare uh, in verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for, for this very purpose I've raised you up that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, verse 18 of chapter 9 of Romans, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Why? Because God is the creator of this world. God wants us to be understood that he is sovereignly in control of everything and that there's nothing anybody can do to stop that control. There's nothing anybody can do to control God's control. And then he would, then he would remind us, and I'm, I'm about to close. He would, he would remind us um, when you get to the, uh, the, end of chapter, the end of chapter 11. Look at verse uh, 33 of chapter 11. He says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable is his, are his judgments and his ways past finding. Let me ask you this. What is it about you you think God made him choose you? What? What? I mean, you're pretty, you're handsome, you, you smell good. I mean, what, what is it? I mean, you know, you were, you were born poor, you were born rich, you were tall, you were short, you were what? What, what, what is it about you that say would make, that would cause God to choose you? No. 
He says, verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, that it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. God does it. Why? Because he came. And there's nothing anybody could do to cause him. So again, the righteousness of God uh, prevails in his choice to provide salvation through Jesus Christ as he wills based only on his wisdom and knowledge. And if I'm talking to somebody out here who may be thinking there's another approach to God, there's some other way you can get to God other than through Jesus Christ, I, 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 no, 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 I don't hate to say it. I want to encourage you to know that that's the only way to God is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the final thing. You're filling in the blanks here, and, I, and we're done. Chapters 12 through 16. Uh, the righteousness of God is obediently practiced by us who believe, filling in the blank, who believe through our responses to society, government, and members of the body of Christ, his church. The righteousness of God is obediently practiced by us who believe through our responses to society, government, members of the body of Christ, his church. Listen, folk, God has given us his righteousness. He's declared us righteous. We have the ability to please God, to do those things that bring honor and glory to him. We have the ability to do those things. And even in a pandemic, even when we're not able to come to the house of worship where we gather, God still expects us to apply that righteousness no matter what. No matter what, when you go into the grocery stores, apply that righteousness. Do that which is pleasing to him. When you go to the doctor's office, when you, when you, um, children getting ready to go back to school, we go back to school, we've got to apply that righteousness because that is his expectation for us. And so when you read chapter 12 to chapter 16, it's just those practical things that he tells us to do. He talks about it in chapter 12, how are we to deal with people, how are we to exercise our gifts that God has given us. But we exercise those gifts with grace. We do it with integrity. We do it with honor. We don't do it with partiality. We don't pick a person and we don't pick this person. Whoever God gives us the opportunity to apply it with, we apply it with them. He tells us to do it with government, uh, whether it's from the executive office of the president all the way to those who are part of city council in our local areas. We ought to have respect and we're to honor them because that's what God has commanded for us to do. And then, of course, members of the body of Christ. God expects us to treat each other a certain kind of way. Why? Because we belong to Christ and all of us are part of the benefit of what Christ has done and sacrificing his life to cause you and I to be able to attain the righteousness of God. So I just want to encourage you moving forward as I said. The point that, the point that we're making is that those of us who have been declared righteous ought to still be living what? By faith. Depending on God. Trust in God believe in God. Uh, Good Shepherd, one of the things I do want to encourage everybody, this is again pu public service announcement, is uh, if you haven't yet uh, turned in your, uh, your uh, census, uh, if you still have that available, please turn that in. Uh, you hear they're asking us to do that. It's a way again of helping uh, our local areas to uh, be able to get some of the benefits that are given by the government as a result of the census. So if you haven't done that, please make sure uh, that you fill that in. I will say that again on our behalf. Please, let's take care of one another, uh, whether we're part of this local church or any other church. Let's do our part. Uh, Good Shepherd, I'm just going to ask you to do this, to kind of put on our thinking caps to see what we need to do to come alongside those parents that are having to make the decision on what to do with their children. Uh, there are a lot of us who are in a position to be able to come alongside them, to help them going forward, uh, trusting God that... Uh, uh, he will use us uh, for service toward them during that time. So let's keep that in mind again uh, going forward. I will be on as far as the conference call again at 7 o'clock tonight and look forward to that. Then Sunday morning, don't forget, prepare, get your elements um, um, for first Sunday again. This is going to be what, April, May, June, July, August. Uh, we're going now on the 20th Sunday of uh, streaming live services. 
And even in the midst of all the discomfort that we may be experiencing, to whatever degree that may be, we have to admit that God is faithful. And God wants us to be faithful to him. Why? Because the just must live by faith. I love you. Until we meet again, God bless and keep all of us. Bye-bye.